It's worth noting that this church tax is still in effect in Germany today, and as it indicates, uh, this tax represents between 8 and 10 percent on income tax collected by the German government. So that's a considerable tithe, one which is still collected from the German people. And again, looking at the uh, involvement of the Pacelli family with this whole working relationship between fascism and the Vatican, Eugenio Pacelli working with Hitler in 1919, Francesco and Eugenio helping to set up the Lateran Treaty in 1926-29, through 29, Francesco and his other brothers serving as members of the board of directors on Nogara's investments stemming out of the wealth accruing to the Vatican from the Lateran Treaty, then Eugenio Pacelli helping to negotiate an accord with Nazi Germany in 1933, and uh, this sets up another very lucrative state arrangement with the Vatican, which produce, puts cash into the Vatican's uh, coffers. And again, that Kirchensteuer, or church tax, is still in effect to this day. So, again, the Pacelli family front and center here. Now, eventually, uh, Pope Pius the, uh, or Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli went on to become Pope Pius the Twelfth. Now, uh, it should be noted that even though, and here again there's an, an analogy uh, that we feel is very important to point out between uh, the, the relationship between the Vatican and the Church today that was similar to, uh, at least analogous in some ways, to the relationship between the Vatican and elements of the Church during the era of the rise of fascism. Now, just as in Central America today, many right-wing or fascist governments, frankly, because that's what the governments of El Salvador and uh, many of these other countries are, they're explicitly fascist uh, governments with strong ties to the Nazis, as we looked at particularly in Radio Free America numbers 14 and 15 in our series about the World Anti-Communist League, uh, church people of all kinds, including Archbishop Romero in El Salvador in 1980, are simply being uh, shot to gristle with abandon by the military authorities. Despite this, there has been... Uh, despite some equivocation and some at least lip service given to condemning this, the fact of the matter is that, that the Vatican has essentially uh, turned a blind eye to the murder of its own church people. Although uh, the current pope, and we're going to take a look at some of his antecedents later in the broadcast, although the current pope uh, is very, very vocal in his opposition to uh, socialism of any kind, although he's apparently been willing to make accommodations, as we'll look at later in our series, uh, the fact of the matter is he has really... Uh, been remarkably tolerant of the outright slaughter of many church people in Latin America. Nuns and priests being disappeared or tortured to death, even an archbishop being shot down in broad daylight, has not brought any more uh, uh, real action by the church against some of these right-wing Italian governments. Now, a right-wing uh, Latin American governments, excuse me, uh, looping back to the Lateran Treaty here. Now, this, a similar thing was happening in Germany, although the Vatican itself had a very lucrative treaty set up with uh, the Third Reich, and this was bringing money into the Vatican through the Kirchensteuer, at the same time, many Catholic priests and practicing Catholics were being put in concentration camps and done in by Hitler. So that we really have a, uh, an ambiguous policy in the 1930s with regard to fascism and, uh, the Va and, and Catholicism, where lower down uh, in, in the uh, Catholic hierarchy, priests and practicing Catholics are being persecuted and murdered. And in fact, the Vatican is uh, at best, although... Uh, Pay again, uh, paying verbal, uh, at least paying lip service to condemning the, uh, to a condemnation of these acts. The fact is that the Vatican is turning a blind eye. At least they were able to for a long time. Now, uh, Pope Pius the twelfth, twelfth successor, Pope Pius the eleventh, and of course remember Pius the twelfth is the former Eugenio Pacelli, uh, funder of Hitler and so forth. Now Pius the eleventh eventually could not stomach the uh, persecution of Catholics by Hitler. Because of this, he became increasingly vocal in his, his criticisms of Hitler and was on the eve of issuing an encyclical condemning Nazism when he conveniently died and was replaced by Pope Pius XII, the former, again, Cardinal Euge uh, Archbishop and Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli. Pius XII not only refused to continue with the process of Pius that Pius XI was engaged in of condemning fascism, but Pius XII then basically re-cemented the good relations between the Vatican and the Third Reich. That was just about his first act, in fact, uh, Paul Murphy here says that was, in fact, his first act upon becoming Pope. Now, again, this Pius XII, the former Eugenio Pacelli. Returning to Paul Murphy's La Popessa. Pacelli's first act, official act, as Pius XII was to court Hitler. Despite his elaborate explanation to her of the papacy's need to walk its own chosen path, Pascalino was infuriated by the condescending message, unquote, that the Holy Father first wrote to the German Führer. From the mid-1930s, Nazi repression of Catholicism in Germany had, gr had grown increasingly relentless. Numbers of priests and nuns had been brought to trial upon all sorts of trumped-up excuses, 
and many had been given stiff sentences. In her eyes, Pacelli's move defied all reason. Hitler himself had publicly denounced the church and the Catholic clergy. Speaking of clerics in general, Hitler said, while always talking about love and humanity, they are in fact interested in only one thing, power. Power over men's souls and hence over their lives. The Catholic Church is like a scheming woman who at first contrives to give her husband the impression that she is helpless and guileless, only to take over power, finally holding it so securely that the man has to dance to any tune she plays. Certainly, Pacelli's predecessor, Pius XI, in his final days had shown no love of Hitler and the Nazis. In his Christmas message of December 25, 1938, only a month and a half before his death, the old pope leveled one of the church's fiercest attacks against any nation. Let us call things by their true name, Pius XI had said. I tell you, in Germany today, a full religious persecution is in progress. A persecution which does not shrink from using every weapon, lies, threats, false information, and in the last resort, physical force. A lying campaign is being carried on in Germany against the Catholic hierarchy, the Catholic religion, and God's holy church. The protest we make before the whole civilized world cannot be clearer or more unequivocal. Now, with the old pope gone, Pacelli seemed lost in vacillation and compromise. Alden Hatch, one of Pacelli's authorized biographers, compared the two popes, claiming they were strikingly different in almost every way. Pius XI was as militant as Pius XII appeared divided and yielding. Of Pius XI, Hatch said, quote, he had a hard will. He was like a dormant volcano, slow to erupt, but capable of violent bursts of energy. Despite all that Hitler had done to insult and weaken the church, and even though Pius XI had written a deathbed encyclical calling upon the world to rid itself of Nazism, Pacelli and his circle of hierarchy were, more, were of a more conciliatory mind toward Nazi Germany. They took a complete about-face stand to the deceased Pope's unyielding position. In fact, they were actually bending to the Nazi Fuhrer, as Pacelli had naively done in helping to subsidize Hitler's rise with church funds 20 years before. The new Pope's militant predecessor in his dying days had so aggressively stirred tensions with Nazi Germany that Pacelli felt it incumbent to offer Hitler an olive branch. The German prelates were effusive in their encouragement and support when the Holy Father announced a new track of papal appeasement toward Hitler. Quote, the world will see that we have tried everything to live in peace with Nazi Germany, unquote, Pius XII told his, cler his ardent clerical supporters. Though Pascalina had no authority to speak her mind officially, she was ready to burst with anger during the session with the German membership of the Sacred College of Cardinals that Pacelli had called to thrash out a compromise with Hitler. The extremes to which the pontiff and his clerical backers went to placate the Fuhrer were altogether appalling to her. And uh, here's next, uh, we're going to read you the text of Hitler's, uh, his, his Hitler's actual message to Nazi Germany, to Hitler, or, or of uh, Pacelli, rather, Pius XII's message to Adolf Hitler upon becoming Pope. And this was his first official act as Pope Pius XII. The message reads as follows. The final text read, To the illustrious Herr Adolf Hitler, Fuhrer and Chancellor of the German Reich, Here at the beginning of our pontificate, we wish to assure you that we remain devoted to the spiritual welfare of the German people entrusted to your leadership. For them, we implore God the Almighty to grant them that true felicity which springs from religion. We recall with great pleasure the many years we spent in Germany as apostolic nuncio when we did all in our power to establish harmonious relations between church and state. Now that the responsibilities of our pastoral function have increased our opportunities, how much more ardently do we pray to reach that goal? May the prosperity of, Ger of the German people and their progress in every domain come with God's help to fruition. Given this day, the 6th of March, 1939, in Rome at St. Peter's in the first year of our pontificate. So, as indicated there, with the, uh, the happiness which, uh, with, with, with which Pacelli apparently was able to deal with Hitler in uh, 1919 was uh, full, still in effect in 1939, when despite the persecution of the church in Germany and despite the vehement anti-Nazi attitude of Pius XI, uh, Cardinal, uh, then Pope Pius XII, the former cardinal, Eugenio Pacelli, who'd helped, uh, along with his brother, negotiate the uh, tri the treaty, uh, who'd helped negotiate the agreement with Hitler in the first place that brought the Kirchensteuer, the same Pacelli who helped, along with his lawyer brother, negotiate the Lateran Treaty, and the same Pacelli who was putting church money in Hitler's hand in 1939 is still basically willing to play ball with the Fuhrer. And of course, six months after this letter, wishing uh, the German nation progress in every domain, uh, the domain that they made progress into was, of course, Poland. 
um, a, an incursion, an invasion uh, that uh, Pacelli found himself unable to condemn, ostensibly because of the 40 million Catholics in the Reich, which of course says nothing for the God knows how many million Catholics that were in Poland at that time, Right, but quite a few. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the, uh, the curious role of the church and uh, fascism in some of the other countries besides Italy and Germany. And that's going to be just in a few moments here. And we are back. And good evening. This is Nip Tuck in the studios with Dave Emery with more of Radio Free America. And we're going to be here until 12 o'clock midnight with this, the first, the kickoff, if you will, of our series on... Uh, well, it's, it's roughly it's the Mediterranean merry-go-round. It's ostensibly on who shot Pope John Paul II, but it's so much wider, so much vaster and more broad than that. Um, it's an incredibly complex tangle. Tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, we are concentrating on trying to put together the earliest stages of, uh, of contact and consolidation of ties between the Vatican and fascist governments, specifically Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy. Uh, both of which were of about equal importance. Hitler's Germany, of course, because of its power and influence. Mussolini's Italy, because of, of course, its influence and proximity to the Vatican. And one of the things we talked about, of course, is the Lateran Treaty of 1929 that uh, basically uh, was, if you want to use a religious term, one might almost say uh, was signing a deal with the devil and uh, is where the Vatican Church gained a great degree of autonomy, especially in financial matters um, and in self policing as far as political matters within the Vatican, which uh, the Vatican itself became a, a separate entity from Italy, but at the same time the Vatican was able to establish um, uh, suzerainty over um, all of Italy in terms of religious matters. It made m mandatory religious instruction possible, uh, mandatory uh, Vatican or Catholic control over uh, the institution of marriage and things of that nature, and it also garnered for the Vatican a large chunk of money, which was promptly invested and began the building of the Vatican financial empire, which is going to be so large a focus of these next broadcasts. Now, in return, the Vatican did not appear to give up much of anything except, as is often in the case with these deals with the devil, one might suggest they gave up their soul. They essentially agreed to step out of the way and let Mussolini and his brown shirts, or his black shirts, excuse me, and Mussolini and his black shirts run Italy as they would, and uh, an implicit agreement uh, to also let Hitler and his Nazis run Germany and later most of Europe as they would. And we've seen already that Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, who was as Secretary of State, helped to negotiate the treaty with Germany, and as whose brother Francesco Pacelli helped to arrange the concordat between Mussolini and the Vatican, that these two brothers, uh, Eugenio Pacelli, later to be Pope Pius XII, already had marked sy sympathies for the Nazis and was strongly anti-communist himself and felt that uh, communistic atheism or atheistic communism, take your pick, uh, was the greatest evil in the world. So we're beginning to see the players line up in their slots uh, for that great push forward known as World War II, which brought so much death and destruction to the human race. Again, noting the there we go. There we go. Noting the continuity now of the uh, Pacelli family, Eugenio, Archbishop uh, of Munich, basically Papal Nuncio to Munich, funding Hitler with church funds in 1919. Then the same Eugenio Pacelli works with the church, while Francesco Pacelli, his brother, a lawyer, works for on behalf of the Mussolini government to set up the Lateran Treaty. Eugenio Pacelli, by then a cardinal, becomes Vatican Secretary of State, helps negotiate a key agreement between the Vatican and Hitler, which, among other things, provides for a tax on all German wage earners, part of which is turned over to the Vatican, the so-called Kirchensteuer. Okay? Then eventually, uh, cardinal, uh, cardinal Eugenio Pacelli becomes Pope Pius XII, and in so doing, he uh, basically reverses the anti-Nazi tendencies of the recently deceased Pope Pius XI should also be known, since we're going to be discussing some of the financial and investment aspects of the Vatican, that Francesco Pacelli and, and many of the, the other Pacelli brothers became key members of board of directors of Vatican-controlled companies. The money that the Vatican was thus investing had come to it as a result of the Lateran Treaty. Okay, now we've named a, a couple of specific instances, of course in Italy, where the proximity, proximity to Mussolini was inescapable, and where Mussolini's government was... Uh, was a given fact that the Vatican probably could not have done that much about at that point in time. Um, we can even make an excuse for Eugenio Pacelli that he was blinded by his sympathy uh, for Germany that he had uh, first gained as papal nuncio to Germany in the 19, 19 teens and 1920s. 
Um, however, as we will find out and as we're beginning to discuss, uh, Pacelli's blind eye that he turned towards fascism extended all over the world and uh, sort of uh, begs the, uh, the question as to whether this could have been isolated incidents doing, due to uh, other circumstances. No, it appears that Pacelli was in fact sympathetic to fascism, or at least very, uh, uh, not very choosy about his allies. We're going to read a short section, a couple of short sections here, from a book called Facts and Fascism, written by George Seldes, S-E-L-D-E-S. -E this book was originally copyrighted 1943 by In Fact Incorporated of New York. Seldes, by the way, was a very famous anti-fascist writer, one of the best-known political muckrakers of his day. His work was uh, submerged during the McCarthy period, and his, uh, his uh, efforts have been consequently eclipsed, but he was one of the real giants of American political research. Unfortunately, because of McCarthy, uh, his name hasn't survived too much. Too yes, he, he, Seldes was one of those people who became known by that oh-so-revealing tag phrase, premature anti-fascist, which, if you stop and think about it, has got to be one of the screamers of our era, and in and, in and of itself describes what went wrong with America in the 1950s, that people could be labeled premature anti-fascist and uh, be criticized for that. Anyway, so that's George Seldes, the author of Facts and Fascism. This first segment is in the middle of a discussion about uh, Spain, the takeover of the fascists in Spain under General Francisco Franco, and uh, a fairly complicated discussion of land reform in Spain at that time, but there's one significant portion of this little thing that we want you to note. In its issue of March 19, 1938, the native fascist Tablet reported that Franco, blessed by the church and called a, quote, child of God, although he had pinned the bleeding heart of Christ on the tunics, of the bloodthirsty Moors, some 150,000 of whom had been imported to do most of the fighting, that is, in the revolution, had given a total of 17,000 acres of land to the peasantry of Spain. Well, what he's saying is that the Catholic Church um, was all the way behind General Franco, despite such things as importing Moorish mercenaries to kill, presumably Catholic, uh, Spaniards, because the, 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 the Republic of Spain, although uh, its name has been somewhat blackened in later years by, again, people like McCarthy in the United States and others, um, the Republic of Spain was largely the center and left of the country. It was not the communists. It was not the socialists. And uh, most of these people were indeed Catholics themselves. So while Franco was importing 150,000 Moors uh, from uh, places like Algeria and and uh, and other North African countries to kill uh, his fellow countrymen, the church was calling him a child of God. And it's, it should be noted here, too, that what the church is doing is basically lending support to the overthrow of a legitimate government. Franco and uh, the other uh, conspirators were basically overthrowing the legitimate government of Spain, and uh, it should be noted here, we're going to talk uh, in a future broadcast about the rise of fascism about the Spanish Civil War, but it should be known that uh, the other West, so-called so Western democracies, Britain, uh, France, the United States, uh, refused to ship arms to either side and refused to condemn the Germans and Italians for arming Franco. The Soviet Union uh, was the only nation to help the Republican side, but the uh, although the the uh, eventual Allied powers, the United States, Britain, France, and so forth. Uh, maintained a straight that that uh, they they refused to ship arms to either side. At the same time, a lot of American industrialists, many of the key ones that we'll be looking at in Uncle Sam and the Swastika, did manage to ship a lot of industrial support to the fascists under the table, while at the same time refusing in any way to take action against the active fascist military intervention on behalf of Franco. The Germans sent many planes and tanks, their so-called Condor Legion of uh, of military aviators, uh, many of the ships coming. Uh, either from the USSR or shipping Soviet arms to the Republicans were being uh, sunk in the Mediterranean by so-called mystery submarines that everybody knew whose, who, whose submarines those were. But it, it should be known that uh, there was actually a very hypocritical attitude on the part of the Western democracies who winked at the uh, Italian and German intervention, again, in support of a fascist revolution against a legitimate government, while they, uh, at the very least, refused to lend uh, any support to either side, and why many industrialists, in fact, ship oil and other uh, st strategic materials to the fascists under the table. Now, of course, one of the reasons, again, um, and this has to be looked at all the time, that although, again, we, are, we're, we want to stress this is not a blanket indictment of Catholicism, and that in many cases, uh, even the Catholics themselves will admit that the, uh, many of the people in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church are fallible men, as are we all, uh, or fallible people, I suppose, as are we all, and that uh, one of the things that seems to crop up time and time again 
in terms of where the Catholic Church throws its support is where the money is going and where the church is being allowed to uh, to use its money and where the church is not being allowed to use its money. And without drawing any direct connections, again, as Dave mentioned earlier in the show, there's a lot of things going on in Latin America these days that uh, that point to that very same problem. In Spain, the problem was that the Republic, uh, the, the government that was eventually overthrown by Franco's revolt, the Republic attempted to disconnect the church from some of its intimate connections in every point of Spanish life. And if anything, the church in Spain was more connected to daily life than the church in Italy was before the Concordat of 1929. And the, the Republicans, uh, again an elected government in Spain, um, presumably following the will of the majority of the Spanish people, attempted to disconnect the state from the church in some of these respects. And of course this was one of the main reasons that the church promptly threw its support behind Franco and his fascist generals. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that from Seldes. He says, An interesting footnote on the Spanish situation was published in the fascist press early in 1940. Said Voice of Spain, quote, Apologists for the nationalist movement have gone to some trouble to point out that the church in Spain is poor, and has been for some time. They have emphasized that nobody has yet produced concrete evidence of the holdings which the church was known to have in commercial undertakings. That is to say, that nobody has been able to produce the share certificates and exhibit them publicly. We should like to have been able to do so for the information of the doubters, but now we do the next best thing. On page 172 will be found a facsimile from a page of ABC, which is a Madrid Franco-fascist paper. The fa uh, Voice of Spain, by the way, is a Republican paper that he's quoting from. Um, will be found a facsimile from a page of ABC, a Madrid Franco paper, of January 7, 1940, showing a list of church shares which were confiscated by the Republican government and now claimed back by the church. What we publish refers only to the shares in the Telefonica. Do our readers consider that this evidence is good enough, or if not, what more do they want in the way of evidence? The fabulous wealth of the church before July 19, 1936 is very well known, especially that held by the Company of Jesus which is estimated at 6,000 million pesetas. The man with, quote, power of attorney in all these holdings was Ruiz Senen, who was on the, on the board of 40 important companies as an agent of the Jesuits, and whose tentacles stretched out into all sorts of industrial undertakings, unquote. Seldes writes, The Telefonica, of course, is the American-owned IT&T building and national telephone system. The advertisement reproduced lists the Metropolitan of, Valen of Valencia, owning hundreds of shares. The Casa Diocesana of the Archbishop of Lerida, 14 shares preferred stock. The Rector of the College of San Jose of Valencia of the Society of Jesus, the College of Maria the Immaculate, and several other church organizations. On January 24, 1940, ABC published a similar advertisement restoring preferred and common stocks and bonds to investors of the Compañía Transatlántica, the steamship line. Among the holders listed were Reverend Pedro Pujol, the Archbishop of Madrid, Alcala, 50 shares, numbered 91,101 to 91,150, the Vicar General of the Congregation of Hermanas Descalzas, de la Tercera Orden de la BVM del Carmen of Tarragona, 9 shares. On January 27, 1940, General Franco signed a decree formally restoring, quote, the vast property holdings of the Society of Jesus, which had been confiscated by the Republic in 1932, unquote, at the time the Jesuits were expelled. How vast this property is, few persons know, as much of it was held in the names of individuals. Monsieur Angel Margot, in L'Espagne au XXe siècle, which means Spain in the 20th century, quoted Aguilera as, as writing that, Quote, one can evaluate about one-third of the national wealth, the goods, movable and immovable, owned by the congregations. The North Railroad, the Transatlantic Company, the Orange Groves of Andalusia, the mines of the Basque provinces, and in the reef, many factories in Barcelona are under their open or occult direction. The Republic of 1931 had separated church and state. The church supported the fascist side in 1936. In 1940, the fascists restored all the confiscated wealth, including stocks and bonds, to the church. Fascism paid off in this instance. Okay, so again, the, uh, the Vatican, as a financial and industrial uh, investor and entrepreneur, stems from the Lateran Treaty of 1929. Among the, uh, the 
foreign investments, which uh, the Vatican has been involved in here, concerns uh, many of the public utilities of Spain, largely because of the immense church holdings and also obviously uh, the ideological uh, aspects. The church backs the fascists in Spain, okay? And we're going to take a look at uh, the church backing the fascists in, uh, the, uh, in the nation of Yugoslavia here, and we're going to come across a person whose name is going to figure very prominently in subsequent discussions. Now, a little bit about uh, the background of what was going on in Yugoslavia before and during World War II. Yugoslavia as a nation was created after World War I. It is comprised of a number of different nationalities, some of whom don't get along particularly well, and that's always been one of the great problems in Yugoslavia, and it is to this day. There's a lot of factionalism. Uh, the Yugoslavian state of Croatia is predominantly Catholic, and there had been a, l a long-standing independence movement for Croatia. Many of the Catholic Croatians had wanted their own independent country and had been working long and hard to do just that. The Vatican, of course, because it would have given them a, another Catholic state uh, to, in their orbit, were very sympathetic towards the whole idea of a, an independent Catholic Croatia. Now, when the Nazis got going, uh, when, when the Nazis invaded Yugoslavia, Croatia became a fascist state, an independent fascist state in the orbit of Nazi Germany. The dominant fascist movement in Croatia, which was very closely affiliated with the Catholic churches, we're going to look here, were called the Ustashi. We looked at the Ustashi in Radio Free America number 15 in connection with the World Anti-Communist League and the assassination of uh, Olaf Palme in Sweden. Now we're going to take a look at the association between the Vatican and the Ustashi of Croatia here, and specifically we're going to take a look at uh, some information from a book called The Nazi Legacy. The Nazi Legacy is subtitled Klaus Barbie and the International Fascist Connection. It's co-authored by three British journalists, Magnus Linklater, L-I-N-K-L-A-T-E-R, Isabel Hilton, and Neil Asherson, A-S-C-H-E-R-S-O-N. It's published in hardcover by Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston, copyrighted 1984. And again, from Linklater, Hilton, and, and Asherson's The Nazi Legacy, some information concerning the close cooperation between elements of the Vatican, the Catholic Church, and the Catholic fascist movement, the Ustashi, in wartime Croatia. Now, the his referred to here, or the he referred to by, this, uh, by the adjective, is a fellow named Father Draganovic, D-R-A-G-A-N-O-V-I-C. We're going to come across Father Draganovic here in, uh, later in the broadcast. He's going to be a key, key person with regard to setting up a, uh, a Vatican-supported exit for Nazis from Europe to Latin America. In this case, though, the discussion here concerns the affiliation between the Church and the Ustashi and uh, Father Draganovich's role as Vatican envoy to the Ustashi here. From the Nazi legacy, reading as follows, Most of his attention was given to fleeing members of the Croatian terrorist organization, the Ustashi, rather than specifically to Nazis. And it is perhaps for this reason that, in the intense debate over the Vatican's attitude to the Nazis, his role has been overlooked. Yet the Ustashi and a few of the Croatian priests who supported them committed war crimes so terrible that even today, in the full knowledge of the Nazi Holocaust, they have a deep capacity to shock. Under the leadership of the puppet dictator Ante Pavlic, who established the independent fascist state of Croatia in 1941 with its capital in Zagreb, the Ustashi carried out a calculated campaign of genocide against more than two million Serbs of the Orthodox faith. By the way, the Ustashi here were anti-Jew, anti-Semitic, anti-Serb and anti-Gypsy chiefly. Their aim, was their aim was spelled out with brutal precision by Dr. Mile Budak, B-U-D-A-K, Pavlich's Minister of Education, who spoke in 1941 of the necessity for killing one-third of the Serbs, expelling one-third, and forcing the remaining one-third to embrace the Roman Catholic religion. Thus, he said, our new Croatia will get rid of all Serbs in our midst in order to become 100% Catholic within ten years. Pavlic himself set his stamp on the campaign when he addressed Ustasha troops in Zagreb, and in the course of a manic speech announced, A good Ustashi is one who can use his knife to cut a child from the womb of its mother. Unquote. From June of 1941, bands of Ustashi roamed the countryside of Bosnia with knives, bludgeons, and machine guns, slaughtering men, women, and children. Whole village populations were massacred, death camps were set up in which prisoners were kept in conditions so appalling that they died of dysentery or other diseases within days of arriving. In one camp, prisoners were bound together by wire and taken to the edge of a precipice where one of them would be pushed over, dragging the others with him. Then, hand grenades would be lobbed down onto the broken bodies. Pavlich's instructions were often obeyed to the letter, with guards attempting to outdo each other in the savagery of their executions in the desecration of bodies. There was often no burial at all following a massacre. 
Even German officers who had seen extermination camps in Poland were horrified by what they witnessed. One who was taken round the camp at Zemun, where a prison population of 70,000 had been reduced to 20,000 in a matter of weeks, was told by the camp commandant, quote, We use Stasi are more practical than you. You shoot, but we use hammers, clubs, rope, fire, and quicklime. It's less expensive, unquote. Some of the atrocities were carried out by or under the supervision of Catholic priests, with the order of the Franciscans often among the worst offenders. They included a Franciscan who was commandant for six months at the, co at the, at the concentration camp of Jasenovac, where tens of thousands of prisoners died, and another at Alipasan Most, where a massacre of 180 Serbs was recorded. The only alternative was forcible conversion to Roman Catholicism. Often whole villages would be received into the church by a single priest with, a, with armed Ustasha guards looking on. But occasionally, with redoubled horror, a congregation of newly converted Catholics would be hauled from the church and shot anyway. The Bishop of Mostar, reporting directly on these atrocities to the head of the Croatian church, Archbishop Stepanak, we're going to talk about him in a minute, in Zagreb, said, quote, They go to Mass, they learn the Catholic catechism, they have their children, ba Catholic catechism rather, they have their children baptized, and then... While the new converts are in church attending Mass, they seize them. Young and old, men and women, drag them outside and send them to eternity in droves. Unquote. Interrupting briefly, Archbishop Stepanak was actually a representative in the uh, Croatian Congress for which he was imprisoned as a war criminal by the post-war Yugoslavian government. Continuing here. This, then, was the regime that Draganovic represented in Rome. That he was a fervent Croatian nationalist is not in doubt. Though his background was that of scholar-priest, he had edited the General Register of the Catholic Church in Yugoslavia in 1939 and was, at the same time, a director of Oriental Studies at the University of Sarajevo and secretary to the Archbishop there. His role in Rome assumed a strong political slant. He had become an ecclesiastical advisor to Pavlic's regime in 1941, then went to Rome in 1943 where the Croatians hoped that his close contacts with the Vatican would be useful in the prom promotion of the Croatian cause and the boosting of the uncertain reputation of Pavlic himself. In this, he may have been at least partially successful. Although the Vatican kept the Pavlic's regime at arm's length in its diplomatic relations, Pope Pius XII never uttered any direct condemnation of Croatian atrocities, restricting his statements to general observations on human rights. When the British minister to the Vatican in private audience ventured to draw his attention to events in Croatia, the Pope referred to Pavlic as, quote, a much maligned man, unquote. The British Foreign Office, to whom this was reported, reacted by saying that, quote, this is really carrying Christian charity a little too far, unquote, and instructed the minister to draw His Holiness's attentions to the reality of Pavlich's violent career. So, reviewing briefly this section we've just looked at, the fascist, overtly fascist, and to the Nazis even excessively brutal regime of uh, Ante Pavlic and the Ustasi in Croatia not only had the active cooperation of church orders, some of whom actually became concentration camp heads, but was winked at by the Vatican, and in fact, a uh, Father Draganovic here, who we're going to look at later on in the broadcast, was uh, an ecclesiastical advisor from, from the Vatican to the Pavlic regime. And uh, this aforementioned Archbishop Stepanak, imprisoned as a war criminal by the post-war Yugoslavian regime, was actually a representative, was seated in the Croatian Congress. We're going to come back to both Father Draganovic and Archbishop Stepanak later in the broadcast. Okay, now, uh, moving on here, uh, basically, from uh, we're going to move on through the war years, and we're going to move on to a, an incident which is somewhat speculative in nature, but again, looking at some of the uh, clandestine maneuvering with regard to U.S. intelligence, fascism, and the Vatican here. We're going to read about uh, a very provocative incident. Uh, again, this is not definitive, but uh, we're, we're really sort of tossing this out by way of, uh, as we like to say, food for thought and grounds for further research. We're reading now from a book called The Last Hero that uh, is about Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the OSS, America's Wartime Intelligence Agency. It was published in hardcover in 1982 by New York Times Books, authored by Anthony Cave Brown. And I would also point out that uh, Cave Brown's The Last Hero is now out in soft cover, so uh, take note of that fact, because uh, it's an excellent book, and it's, it's crammed with information, like many of the others, now out in soft cover. What we're going to be dealing with here are some curious events involving uh, diplomatic negotiations between the Nazis, the Vatican, the U.S., the British, and possibly the Vatican-inspired opening of the Western Front to the uh, Western Allied armies in order to prevent a Russian occupation of Germany. 
Reading now from The Last Hero by Anthony K. Brown. In March of 1945, Donovan here, by the way, is Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the OSS. Again, in March of 1945, Donovan's movements, which were always difficult to track, became exceedingly mysterious at a time when the German general staff was indicating its desire to open the Western Front to the Western Allies and allow them to occupy all Germany before the Red Army. At least in part, these approaches derived from WJD's special connections at the Vatican. WJD is William Donovan, by the way. These had, uh, uh, let me read that last sentence again. In, at least in part, these approaches derived from WJD's special connections at the Vatican. And I would also note that uh, eventually Donovan was made a Knight of the Order of Sylvester, one of a number of Vatican uh, uh, orders, which we'll be talking about again later in the broadcast. Continuing. These, meaning Donovan's uh, Vatican connections, had opened up in July and August of 1944 when Donovan held highly secret conversations with the German ambassador at the Holy See, Baron Ernst von Weissacker, an associate of Canaris's. Canaris is the head of the Abwehr, German military intelligence. The conversations were arranged by, it is believed, Pope Pius XII, for WJD saw the Pope in July. And following the talks, the contact between Donovan and Weissacker was maintained, as the Donovan papers show, by Colonel Joseph Rodrigo a regular army intelligence officer who had transferred to the OSS and was stationed in Italy. Rodrigo's contact with Weissacker was through Weissacker's counselor at the embassy, Albert von Kessel. It was to transpire that both Weissacker and Kessel had connections with important members of the German general staff, including the chief of the German general staff, General Heinz Guderian, and Field Marshal von Rundstedt, the supreme German commander on the Western Front. While the matter broached by Weissacker and Kessel was an attempt to surrender on terms intended to permit the Wehrmacht to, to maintain the Eastern Front, terms that were therefore totally unacceptable, in Weissacker there nevertheless remained a powerful and influential contact with the German general staff, a replacement for the unfortunate Canaris, who had been arrested after the, after the July 20th bomb attack on Hitler's life and was, it, thought, it was thought, in an SS concentration camp. The Weissacker contact was still in existence in March of 1945 when the Allied armies rolled up to the Rhine for the last offensive against Germany. As a result, the secret war had entered its trickiest stage, one in which the OSS was required to display the most judicial attitudes toward the reports from its representatives overseas if the Grand Alliance was not to be damaged and perhaps destroyed at the most critical phase of the war when the nature of the peace was being decided. After several real and false attempts at securing an accommodation with the Western powers, on January 24, 1945, as the German Panzer armies were withdrawing from the Ardennes, Donovan advised the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the German ambassador to the Vatican, Baron von Weissacker, and Kessel had informed a British representative that they were prepared to give important information concerning General, General der Panzertruppen Heinz Guderian. That Guderian, with Rundstedt, was prepared to open the Western Front to Eisenhower's armies. And again, this is right after the Battle of the Bulge, the last German offensive attempted uh, an attempt to halt the Western Allied uh, advance. Okay, now continuing on with the last hero, <coughs> excuse me, by Anthony K. Brown. Now events took a most mysterious turn, which seems to have involved Donovan directly. Donovan left the Western Front for Washington on February 7th, 1945 arrived back in the United States on the 8th and lunched with Ruth, that's his wife, by the way, according to her diary on the 9th. He then rejoined his headquarters, busying himself with many matters, the most important being his plans for a post-war central intelligence service, the plans that had been so rudely exposed by Troan in mid-February. Yet despite the highest importance of the CIA matter, in the third week of February 1945, something made Donovan leave Washington suddenly and very secretly. He went to unusual lengths to cover his tracks. Where he went, whom he saw, remains a mystery. His OSS records show he was in Washington throughout this period, but his personnel file with the Adjutant General shows that on February 24, 1945, he departed for the European Theater of Operations, while on February 26, 1945, Ruth recorded, quote, Bill did leave today for Hawaii, unquote. It seems that Donovan's journey was connected with a signal sent on February 27th by Eisenhower to Marshall and the Combined Chiefs that he had, quote, received word via OSS channels of a possible approach by one or more senior German officers with a proposal of facilitating an Allied victory in the West in order to end the war promptly, unquote. 
Eisenhower advised that he had, quote, replied to my informant that, as these reports have gone to my governments, any action on political levels will obviously be taken at their direction, and that so far as any purely military approach is concerned, the channel should be those which are recognized by the customs and usages of war, unquote. He ended his message by stating that he had, quote, no intention of choking off this channel of possible communication with me, unquote. Now, there's one important thing that's going on here, which is that Eisenhower is basically saying that, as far as he is concerned, that any surrender on the part of Germany has to be undertaken through the normal political channels, through the governments and the allied governments, which includes Russia. Okay, this is a key point, because this is going to come up later on. As part of that intention, Donovan's representative at Eisenhower's headquarters, Lieutenant Colonel O. Franklin, uh, C Colonel Franklin O. Canfield, received a request from one of Eisenhower's staff officers to be ready to take part in staff conversations with representatives of the German general staff intended to realize the surrender of all German forces on the Western Front. Canfield was to recall that he was not told where the conversations were to be held or with whom they were to be held. He held himself in readiness for several days and then, quote, so far as I was concerned, the lines went dead and I heard no more about the conversations, unquote. The question, therefore, was whether William J. Donovan flew to Europe to take over the contact. Nobody could be sure because of the mystery that always attended Donovan's journeys. As Robert Joyce was to state, quote, Donovan was always flying in unannounced without saying where he had come from. Our long association seems to have been confined to meetings between the two of us between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. on some highly secret political matter. And then he would vanish in his DC-3, end quote. This was by no means the end of the mystery. While it is known that the Rundstedt talks came to naught, Eisenhower was prepared to accept nothing less than unconditional surrender to all members of the Grand Alliance, including Russia. On March 7th, there occurred one of the most dramatic and inexplicable incidents of the campaign in northwestern Europe. This was the failure of the German general staff to destroy the Ludendorff Bridge over the Rhine at Remagen the bridge over which the U.S. First Army flowed to take over vast areas of central Germany before they were occupied by the Red Army. Okay, so again, the Germans themselves here are basically attempting to divide the Western Allies from the Soviet <laughs> Union and to arrive at a separate peace which would allow them to keep the Russians out of Germany. Obviously, uh, the many died in the wool anti-communist elements in the United States, including the, most of the uh, key industrialists and general staff, were of a similar mind here. Uh, Eisenhower, however, was uh, maintaining his political correctness uh, in, in resisting these efforts. But that's what's going on here. Then on March 7th, inex inexplicably, as the uh, the text here uh, has uh, correctly characterized it, although the Germans were very successful at blowing all of the bridges uh, in, on the Rhine, one of them mysteriously remained untouched. And uh, this, basically, again, the, the Remagen Bridge allowed the Western, uh, the, the American and British armies to just pour into Germany ahead of the Red Army. And it, it is, uh, it, it was a mysterious incident and roused a great deal of suspicion, and to this day is a subject of, of great controversy and obviously, as we like to say, food for thought and grounds for further research. Obviously, that's the view that Anthony K. Brown has taken here. And uh, indeed, the, the Remagen incident and uh, the many attempts by elements of our uh, intelligence service and military to arrive at a separate anti-communist peace with the Nazis aroused a great deal of acrimony between Stalin and, Chir and uh, Roosevelt here. 